predominantly at the end of the day is how can we add value to our clients in what is a rapidly changing industry. Episode 139. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm talking to Tomasz Romanovich, who is an associate at Bon Brian. He's in charge of land regeneration and development, and he commenced his role, his current position at Bon Brian in around about 2017 and has become a specialist with a focus on bridging the gap between the traditional norms of architect and developer. Uh, These duties include sourcing development opportunities both on and off market and acting as a lead architect on regeneration projects within the practice. So this was a really um, interesting conversation because we got to speak about a lot of different topics. We looked at the reasons for Bon Brian being based in Birmingham, and we look at Birmingham as a hub for development and one of the kind of major players in the UK. We discuss developer and land strategies and proactive business models that Bon Brian are currently utilising, and we talk about the structure and growth of Bon Brian and Thomas's role in that. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Tomasz Romanovich. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Tomash, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? Thanks, Rio. Great to be a massive fan of the show and uh, uh, delighted for the offer to to contribute to one of the podcasts. Thanks for the invitation. My pleasure. Very excited to have you here. Now, you are an associate at Bond Brian. You've been there for since 2017, I believe. Yeah, that's that's right. After a a kind of long career, both studying and working in London, um, made the venture back to Yorkshire at the end of sort of 2017. Got it. Great. And you're, you're based up in Birmingham. Uh, based in Birmingham now, as of as of January um, of this of this year. Previously, I mean, as an office, we, we've got the HQ in Sheffield. Uh, we've got a Birmingham office, which I'm based out of. Uh, we've also got offices in in, in London and Westrum. But um, after sort of two and a half years, three years in the Sheffield office, as part of our growth within the Midlands, uh, was presented with a, with a massive opportunity to contribute to what is a you know a really exciting place to be an architect in in Birmingham at the moment. Excellent. How would you describe your role? My role, so it's it's I've got a kind of colourful background, sort of in and out of architecture. So during my sort of ten years in London, yeah. uh, you know, went through this traditional route. Uh, did my undergraduate le- at Leeds, uh, did a year out uh, at Paula Thomas Edwards, um, and then did my diploma at the CAS, uh, now London Metropolitan University, and uh, worked for a number of practices, uh, DSDHA, uh, Coffee Architects, and it was around the time of, of kind of qualifying that um, I. Got up, I had a realization that there was a massive disconnect in terms of where the industry was and what I'd kind of learned as a student as part of my evolution, both in kind of full time academic education and uh, what we'd learned in the part three. Mm. And, you know, as I was running jobs or starting to run jobs, um, I felt there were just big things that had a massive kind of disconnect in relation to um, viability and understanding how and why development happens. Uh, things like areas that was never mentioned at university. I didn't think numbers were a thing. Um, so I, I had a sort of change in direction and spent two years working in uh, development management for a, an Asian based fund, basically pumping money into sort of London, the Southeast. Right. And that was a really interesting experience in understanding um, uh, the process of acquiring land and how a kind of project happens, uh, what's important to clients, um, and um, then managing that process that through either through planning or, um, or or into construction. And I had a big realization during that period. I thought, you know, why aren't architects? Um, uh, 
incorporating a lot of these elements um, into their sort of day-to-day discourse. Yeah. Um, and anyway, the, the uh, you know, being a Yorkshire lad, um, you know, I had some changes in my sort of personal circumstances. I, I'd done a kind of solid straight 10 years in London. Um, and the northern economies, the, the regional cities really started to pick up again. And obviously Manchester was very much kind of leading the way in, in that respect. Uh, there were some really exciting things in, in, in Birmingham, which I'll come on to later. But the north in general became a really exciting place to be an architect again. And it was just too much of a good, too good of an opportunity uh, to not uh, sort of come back, really. Um, so my role within Bon Brian, um, it's uh, very much a kind of national focus. Um, you know, I'm based out of the Birmingham office, but I tend to work across the UK. Right. But what I do is I work in a department within the business called Strategic Development, which is essentially... Um, a, a, a kind of gap in the market that we realise, where um, which is in between... Um, what a developer does and an architect's appointment. So it's very much about facilitating opportunities for clients, bringing developers land opportunities directly, and also kind of growing relationships with kind of key personnel within the public sector, whether that's kind of city regions, uh, uh, sort of councils, et cetera, as a means of sort of generating projects within the business. So, so is this something where you guys are actually actively looking for sites and for land and then you're Absolutely. Able- and how does that work? Are you, are you kind of using tools like Landsec and Google Maps and finding yeah. sites? Or Yeah, I'm a massive prop tech fan, yeah. And um, yeah, Land Insights are a really good platform for that, but it only does a, a kind of proportion of your job. In terms of um, sourcing land and sort of finding land, it all comes down to relationships at the end of the day. You know, sort of the property world are very much of a kind of word to mouth industry. And I still feel a lot of architects really struggle with that concept, but it's a case of just getting out there and engaging with people. But it's not just within the private sector you know we, we, we get opportunities you know developers and, and sort of contractor developers and investors do see as an as, as do see bon brian as an architect too yes you know you know we're you know we're, we're award-winning designers and, and and all the rest of it but fundamentally we understand what their concerns are with, mm. with an asset and maximizing the value of that asset and it's about finding the balance between those two components so yes it, it comes from the private sector uh, we also have really good relationships within uh, the public sector which stemmed from our track record within the education sector so historically bon brian's uh, predominant outputs um, in, in terms of sectors was higher education further education schools that sort of thing over that period of time and we've built up some phenomenal relationships with the public sector and, and, and local authorities and a big part of that component is is trust and gaining right. that trust. you know we're not a developer so we can get intelligence about um uh, uh land they're looking to dispose over the coming years um any land opportunities that um, they might be looking for kind of partnerships with um, investors, uh, d- developers, developer contractors in, in, in a lot of cases. So there's, there's those mediums. And we, we do assist a lot of local authorities with their land disposal programs. We are in discussions with a number about uh, bringing in our expertise and our kind of network to facilitate a council-led housing delivery program, which is really mm. exciting. Um, and then it comes from other means. So a big part of our uh, work in further education and and we have kind of expanded this into how we approach master planning and and sort of placemaking opportunities is um, a a kind of sort of space needs methodology so we're working with a number of the FE colleges and these relationships go back decades where more often than not they they own a number of sites within a within a town or city our sort of space needs methodology identifies, well, you can actually get all your students on sites A and B, but on sites C and D, more often than not, these sites are in really good locations for residential development, mixed use development. So we bring in a team to work with them and it gives us a vehicle to create an off-market opportunity for a developer client as well. Got it. So, so, so in a way, you're actually serving a lot of um, landowner clients and helping them understand what's what's available with some Precisely. of their, with their assets that they might and not have even considered or weren't even thinking about doing projects there. Precisely. And a lot of these are really inexperienced landowners as well. Like there's, um, I think generally across the general public within the UK, there's a big misconception of how risky development and construction is. Mm. Um, so a lot of them are really experienced landowners, whether it's further education colleges, whether it's, uh, we work with a number of charities, uh, church organizations are working one at the moment who are looking at disposing of that asset. And it's a case of us bringing in the right team, not just internally across Bon Brian, but the right investors, the right developers, the right contractors to uh, make that process as sort of simple as possible. Got it. Very interesting. And how did, can you just tell us a little bit about the structure of Bon Brian? 
Uh, absolutely, yeah. So um, we, we cover the, the kind of full geography of the UK. As, as I mentioned, I'm out of Birmingham. The HQ uh, was uh, established in in, uh, in Sheffield over 30 years ago. We've right. got it's in uh, Westrom and London as well. Um, in terms of size, uh, we're the 51st biggest practice in the UK at the moment, as looking at the kind of AJ100 survey last year. So it's 133 staff with, with six directors. We have um various teams or what we call delivery teams and they're managed by associate director level that's uh, you know the production of projects so that's everything from you know the kind of standard riba appointment uh, feasibility right up to the delivery then within that um, we have various um, strategic groups um one uh, strategic development team which, which i'm um, is one of them um, and then we have a, a variety of sort of sub brands within the office um, which kind of focus on certain specialism, certain sectors. So strategic development, uh, we uh, have a digital uh, team, which are, are kind of sort of pioneering the use of BIM. And, you know, that's been very much at the heart of what we do since the early 1990s. We, we've kind of taken BIM on board. Yeah. Um, landscape. Um, so we do architectural landscape. Schemes are so placemaking led now these days. And um, that kind of coordination between architecture and landscape. And we often find a lot of clients uh, want to avoid appointing a landscape architect or really late on having a landscape team within our studios working with us directly um you know really you know is, is a really good means for adding value we have um, an interiors team um, and then uh, uh, we established a, a living brand um or, or in the process of establishing a, a living brand which is all our residential work but it's not just about kind of producing buildings and, and, and building outputs it's essentially a, what, 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 an industry leading solution for um d uh, developers investors housing associations um uh, local authorities and city regions to create outstanding places to live and it goes right from uh, facilitate and sourcing land uh, design delivery and then a lot of kind of post-occupancy analysis which is becoming more and more important to us in terms of how people use spaces so, so it's quite a vertically integrated business in terms of the different disciplines that are involved in the in the practice uh, absolutely, yeah, but the, you know, the, the, there's no sort of kind of set hierarchy in that sense. You know, a part one's opinion on a design is equally as important to um, a director. So I, th I think you know you need that kind of middle ground between a balance of um, sort of specialisms and uh, kind of wider sort of strategic thinking within a business. And I think that's sort of testimony to you know why we've been around for over thirty years. You know, mm. our, our architectural practice is one of the most challenging sort of business models in terms of your vulnerability and I think you, you know you, just, you need that balance between the two and at the rate that the industry is changing that's going to be fundamental going forward. It's really interesting um, how you were talking about as well how the, the opportunities that are present up in the northern economies yeah and and how the business is structured and how the headquarters the headquarters is in Birmingham. So uh, right. Sheffield. Yeah, in the, Sheffield. Yeah the, right. yeah. Got it. And and why why Birmingham? Why Sheffield? Uh, well, uh, historically, we started out out of uh, Sheffield. The original directors, John Bond and John Bryan, and the yep. office has grown out of that kind of that that Yorkshire network. Um, the second office to be established was uh, Westrum. Um, that came out of a lot of the education work we were doing in the southeast, particularly in relation to uh, Kent schools and mm -hmm. the way that those are structured around uh, grammar schools and things like that. So, with the amount of work that we, that we picked up down there, sort of generated a, a really good, strong position, business position for opening an office. Office. And then um, we opened a London office around sort of six, seven years ago, which uh, we opened up on a very different angle. Historically, our work was education and advanced manufacturing, that the work um, within the London office is, is predominantly residential. Um, and then Birmingham, for, for a number of reasons, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of generic reasons why that you can read in, in, in the press as to, as to why Birmingham's a really exciting market. But I think it just epitomizes, as an opportunity, Birmingham epitomizes what we do at Bon Bryan. Um, there's some incredible opportunities here, whether it's, um, it's the youngest city in Europe at the moment. So from a yeah. demographics perspective, we're really interested in housing delivery and diversify or, or ways we can use our our role as an architect to diversify the housing market and, and get the public sector, the, the local authorities and developers to really understand by, you know, good quality place making is, is going to be done through a diversity of kind of housing types and housing products. Birmingham's going to be an incredible platform for that. 
its potential around brownfield land is, is phenomenal. Um, I've never been in a place with, with, with so much potential. And, you know, when we talk about things like regeneration, you know, um, we always say it doesn't matter how challenging an area is or how challenging a site is. What's that long term view? What can we plug into? And with Birmingham, it's got some incredible pieces of amenity with a canal. Um, it's uh, transport infrastructure, you know, the, the, the local authority and the city region have got a really good reputation for getting things done and for getting things done quickly yeah. uh, to unlock sites and unlock development and public transport is absolutely key to that. And then um, wider, the, the, the kind of wider view of that is, um, I think we're, we're definitely seeing a change in attitude within the UK and, it, and it's not, and maybe this is a combination that I've moved out of London and I'm kind of seeing things in a different perspective, but I think there is a, clearly a, a strong desire to see a more kind of re-leveling up of the UK and that doesn't mm. mean taking away London's economy, it just means bringing the rest of the economies, you know, up to a more kind of credible level and I think, you know, HS2 is going to be absolutely key to that not just for getting into London, but for making more kind of localized journeys. And generally speaking as well, Birmingham's strategic position within the United Kingdom, located within the Midlands and stuff, I think is, is gonna be of immense kind of benefits to its future. So in, in the grander scheme of things, it, it's it's a really exciting place to be an architect at the moment. And we're, you know, we're looking forward to making our contribution to the to, to the city plan and the, and the next phase of the, of the sort of city's evolution. Um, I think there's, you know, certain points in history when you look at European cities where there were just really exciting things happening, whether that's yeah. Rene's Florence, whether that's Berlin in the late 80s, early 90s, I definitely put Birmingham in, in, in that category. And as we come out of COVID, I think Birmingham has a really good opportunity to redefine what is the British city in a kind of post-COVID world. Whereas if you look at places like Manchester, they're quite advanced in their development journey. Maybe they don't have the opportunity to kind of ask those questions or maybe answer them um, comprehensively. So yeah, it's, it's a really exciting this is really interesting because often you know we talk about emerging markets and mm. often we think about working internationally and finding work yeah, in, in, yeah. in different in different countries but actually yeah. uh, the rest of the uk has some incredible cities with loads of interesting opportunities absolutely and, and we get we do get a little bit kind of london centric and kind of blindly the rest of the most of the, you know, the majority of the industry is focused in London for the best for the best part, particularly in our, our news and how we speak. And that is that the, not realizing the yeah the expansive opportunities that exist elsewhere. Absolutely, yeah, and I think it's you know it's really exciting to be a young architect at the moment. Certainly from our generation, Rion. I mean, it was all about London, you know, going to London to do your part one. The, the industry was sort of centralised there, but I think the way the UK is going and uh, the kind of refocus on the regions, there's a number of cities at, at your kind of peril to kind of rethink. Well, you know, what do I want out of my career, and you know, what kind of what type of projects do I want to work on, and mm. all the kind of regional cities have you know got different constraints, different challenges. Um, so I think it's really exciting for the country in general and, and, and the industry as a whole. You were, you were going back to what you were saying about your role um, as land regeneration and development specialist yeah. at Bon Bryan and yeah. the amount of opportunities that are existing in brownfield sites around yeah. around Birmingham. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about or give us an example about how you work with your developer clients or um, in terms of like actually locating a site and what's the process or what's the appraisal process that you guys go through? Because is, is this is this a service that you're being paid for or is it kind of you're finding the opportunities and this is part of your business development? Um, a, a, a bit of both. Yeah, it's um, it, I think it's a combination of those factors. I think in essence where it came from, it, just, to, just to kind of go back a bit, it's, yeah. it came from a, I learned a lot working in development management, Rion, and it was really interesting to have a kind of two-year period, kind of seeing things from a kind of client's perspective as, as, as to ways and means that architects can add, add value. And so in essence, it's about restructuring what we do. So the kind of core essence is there, but, you know, we, I speak to a lot of architects and the rise of uh, DMB procurement, for example, uh, project management over the last sort of 20, 25 years, how our role has changed and kind of diminished in a lot of instances. Many architects resent this 
I see this as immense opportunity to kind of redefine what we do as a as a kind of much more kind of interdisciplinary offer with with mm. you know architectural services at its core. It's kind of strange for me as well. I, I do look like look I do like looking back at history and kind of reading, um, you know, reading reading stuff about kind of architects in previous times. And I'd always say that you know the issues that we're facing are, are no different to you know the issues that we had sort of five five hundred years ago. But you know, if you look at sort of Sir Christopher Wren, he wasn't just an architect. He, you know, he he had a, a QS role in. St. Paul's Cathedral. He had a much more kind of interdisciplinary role than, than, than what you kind of think. Same with all the kind of Renaissance greats, Michelangelo, uh, Alberti, etc. They were much more kind of interdisciplinary than just kind of out and out architects. Um, and um, you know the, the way the industry's going. Um, you know to, to, to take on the, the great issues of our time, whether it's uh, you know making our role more relevant, sustainability, carbon zero, MMC you have to have an understanding beyond just being a designer in a multidisciplinary team in that wider commercial framework. Um, so things like development facilitation and adding more value around that process, um, adding more value around how we deliver buildings as well is going to be absolutely fundamental going forward. So it comes from, um, in, in terms of sort of sourcing brownfield land and, 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 and sourcing sites, it's just about using key skills. Um, you know, there is a sort of set methodology that, that we apply, you know, looking at where sort of new transport infrastructure is going, uh, the way a lot of land finders who are working to, for, for, for developers work, for example, um, they will identify a site or they'll have a kind of land specification that they're working to. And it's very much a kind of numbers based process. Whereas architects have got this skill where we can quite easily look at a site and kind of visualize what the potential are. We can quite quickly identify what the constraints are. So once you underpin that kind of architectural problem solving methodology with a knowledge of kind of viability, uh, planning policy, uh, what makes sites stack up. Um, that's, that's, you know, that's used as a kind of means for sort of generating uh, those, those sort of land opportunities really. That's, that's really, that's really, really interesting. Do, do you find that then that, uh, oh, have, have you guys ever considered going down the, the full developer, developer route yourself? Or is that not something that you would want to be doing? It's too much of a change of discipline. No, long term, it's really exciting. I mean, uh, and I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of what's going on in America. And um, uh, there's, a, there's a, a practice that I became a big fan of uh, during my university time called Shop Architects, which has right. this kind of dual model of um, architect acting as, as a developer. I think it's a really exciting methodology. Um, similarly as well, when I was doing my part one, at, um, Paula Thomas Edwards, they had a development angle to what they did. Uh, whereas, you know, they were looking at a number of sites. One of them was a school they did in, in the 1990s. And basically to fund the school, um, they built an apartment block, which they developed. And their own offices, I believe, as well, were part of that kind of development. So, yeah, it, I think it's a really exciting uh, methodology. Uh, the, the issue is within the kind of commercial framework that we're working with in relation to things like PI, um, uh, RIBA code of conduct and kind of um, uh, uh, conflicts of interest. And think, I think it's a, it's a lot more difficult than... Um, than it is and things like cash flow the ability to do that to kind of fund that process is going to be a big issue so I, I don't think it's the kind of thing that you can just kind of get off the ground quite easily but like longer term yes it's absolutely something that we want to be doing I'd say you know within the next 10 years amazing I suppose it's a, a new sets of disciplines involved there particularly in terms of financing as you say and working with investors and actually how you structure the business in terms to be able to have ownership over projects yeah definitely and you know it, it i think it sort of stems from a lot of the work we're doing with the public sector where we're often a kind of go to pair of hands to um sort of facilitate making opportunities happen so the work that we're doing um, in, the, in the kind of very early stages at the moment with a, a number of local authorities in supporting them with their own council delivery housing programs um, you know, we're working with some really exciting funders in, in respect of that, where it's um, in a lot of cases, you know, you don't always need a developer. It's just a case of kind of piecing the right team together. So we've gone this far. So, you know, why is an architectural practice can't we make that next step? So, yeah, definitely in the long run, really, it's something that we want to be doing. How, how has this kind of reinvention of the architect's role, if you like, been born at Bon Brian? Um, that's a, it's, it's, it's a good question. I think... Um, we're a really established practice, yeah. um, uh, you know, been going for over sort of 30 years, but the housing and regeneration side of what we do um, is, is pretty new. It's, you know, only really within the last sort of five years is, we, you know, we've made housing a massive part of our growth um, from a kind of strategic perspective. And that kind of stemmed from a number of reasons. I know 
historically when we did only did kind of fe higher education schools etc the, the the business came under a lot of complications as, as part of the collapse of the building schools for the future program where we lost a lot of work and a lot of kind of planned or or arranged fees quite quickly and um I noticed it as well, kind of working in, in, in practices when I start to do my part one um, around the kind of financial crash of 2008, that the practices who were more successful, um, there were two things what they got right. They had key relationships within a business, both externally in terms of clients, but they had a diversity and a wide range of work that they could fall back on. Yeah. Kind of sectors are sort of peaking and troughing. So what we thought within the business um, um, in terms of how we could grow our residential work, because, you know, in, in the context of what, what we're doing in, in the education sector, we compete with all the nationally renowned architects, the Hawkins Browns, the Field and Cleggs, et cetera, in terms of getting shortlisted for those kind of higher education projects. But at, at housing, we had to give ourselves a USP to compete with practices who've got kind of 20, 30 years worth of kind of built up portfolio of work. So it's how do you add value within that process? So we identified that, you know, we need to kind of forget the kind of traditional REBA stages and have this part of our business which um, is all this kind of upfront facilitation work so I would say what I do within uh, the strategic development team is, is pretty much REBA stage minus three if you can kind of contextualize it into the kind of REBA plan of work um, and once you have land opportunities and are able to kind of facilitate opportunities you have a lot more control and a lot more value to a client in terms of the type of work that you do as well um, equally as well you know there's, there's a big emphasis on delivery um, and, um, you know, using things like BIM, which we've been using and pioneering since the early 1990s. Um, so we model everything from, from day one. Um, we've been working up a methodology specifically for the residential sector, which basically takes the, the best bits of, of BIM level two and kind of mm. puts it into a methodology for delivering high density residential buildings. One of the issues that we're having at the moment, because, you know, in certain sectors where there's a requirement for kind of BIM level two and, and, and things like that is, if you pitch that in a residential context for a private client, um, those services alone would make you not cost effective for that job. So we, you know, we had a kind of brainstorming session and worked out, well, what do clients want? What do developer contractors want in respect of this? So they want to understand that you can uh, manage change control with housing projects particularly, um, there's revision after revision after revision to get it to stack up. Um, they, you want, need to demonstrate that you've managed to maximize the value of that asset. Um, it's the most efficient building possible, but it's married with that consensus of being a design-led element. Um, it's balanced with kind of planning policy and BIM really allows us to do that. And it, we've also expanded it as well uh, to um, incorporate things like modern methods of construction, which were, um, I would say we're a leading architect on. Uh, we won off-site architect of the year award last year and that skill set came predominantly from our education work and transferring that skill set in, into a residential context and then being able to um, use technology to set things like sustainability targets really early on quite quickly um, with kind of pieces of software etc so it's, it's predominantly at the end of the day is how can we add value to our clients mm. in what is a rapidly changing industry well it's, it's really interesting there you were saying about how you know if you were to give the stages of work that you're doing, it would be kind of Reba minus stage three, for example. Yeah. Do, do you find that actually being involved that earlier on, because that's quite different from being reactive, if you like, exactly, when, a, yeah. when a developer comes to you and says, can you give us an appraisal on this site? And then yeah. you've got a few days to turn something around and the yeah. developer's already got their numbers worked out for you. Yeah. And then that actually, you know, a lot many architects find themselves in a bit of a bind kind of when you're when you're you're entering the product in too late because you're not able to interrogate the brief fully yeah ab absolutely and i think you you got the nail on the head there rion it's you know we're proactive proactive as opposed to kind of reactive in that process mm. and um uh it, it it does you you do learn a lot more about that front end process which you know from a client's perspective they've actually gone quite far down the line to get into that point before yeah. an architects on board whereas you know the i'd probably say the, the wider perception within the industry is that it, it's it, it's quite early on when um, um and i think that that's that comes back to a kind of wider conversation that i think is needed at industry level about rethinking the potentially rethinking the reba plan of work and mm -hmm. is the reba plan of work and how we're educating architects at part three level actually reflective of where the industry is and i'd probably say no and that's that's very interesting i mean and this is you know there's many many architects who are you know getting interested in 
development and regeneration and mm. actually and being involved in those earlier stages and how what you're describing here is actually you as the practice are actually able to have a lot more control uh, and you're bringing a, a huge more amount of value to the client Definitely. as a result do you guys ever actually get to change or suggest the usage of the site so perhaps a client is traditionally a housing developer um, but perhaps you guys are like well actually no you could use it for this different type of typology um, it's difficult at the moment because predominantly the, the biggest value in land at the moment is is residential so that's going to be the right. first port of call but um, longer term and um, as new sectors or, or existing sectors start to restructure themselves I think there's a big opportunity in that particularly in respect of Birmingham where um, there's a huge opportunity uh, to almost redefine what the workspace is. And I think we're going to see that generally across, across the, certainly across the Western world and um, anyway, as, as, as a kind of consequence of COVID. And that would be an instance where, um, you know, a site would come through, whether it's an existing building or, or, or a piece of brownfield land. And, you know, it could have much more of a kind of um, workspace or communal element to it rather than it just being a kind of out and out uh, residential site. But I've got to give clients a lot of credit as well. A lot of clients are really understanding, particularly from an urban regeneration context, that residential led mixed use development is the way to forward in terms of being able to sort of create place. I think out and out residential developments are going to become kind of less and less so over the next couple of decades anyway. Oh, very, very interesting. Um, uh, how, how you guys were talking about the, the digital brand. Yeah. Um, you mentioned to me earlier and obviously Bon Brian has gone for a rebrand and a name change and the word architects has been dropped. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Cause I think, you know, it, and it all comes back to, you know, how can we, provide greater value to our clients needs in, in, a, in a rapidly changing industry and you know we see our role as a much more uh, kind of interdisciplinary in terms of its day-to-day -day discourse so that's how the kind of series of kind of sub brands grew uh, but the, the, the digital brand and, and and what Rob Jackson's um, doing in respect of that that's about sort of three four years and it, it, three four years old and it came from a similar need to diversify what what we do um, in terms of not only supporting Bon Brian's uh, kind of BIM outputs and sort of digital outputs, but it being um, being able to be used in a kind of wider industry context. So what, what do I mean by that? So for example, the digital department get um, employed as an out and out information manager on projects that Bon Brian aren't even working on. Um, they do all the R&D within the practice, um, uh, wider consultancy, as well as sort of collaborate on, on, on sort of wider projects. And I think as well, it's, it, it's important to stress that the solution to architectural services might not always be a building or the, or at least in the kind of first instance. And I think that's where we need to sort of challenge a lot of kind of preconceptions. So the first solution might be that, you know, we can, we can use our digital methodology to analyze how you fundamentally use your space and uh, whether there's a better way of doing it rather than uh, buying a new site or um, extending a building. And, and when we can add value through that process. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really interesting angle to take in respect to that so, so what was the the conversation around the usage of the word architect and because this is again this is an interesting industry-wide conversation in terms of the the brand value mm. of the word architect and the constraints of the word architect yeah i think there's a lot of constraints with, with it i think you know there's massive disconnect no industry level in terms of uh, consultants and contractors and developers that we work with about what an architect does and yeah don't even get me started on the general public <laughs> like it's uh, and uh, you know I, I still have uh, you know explained to my kind of closest family what we do and it's it's a it's a really sort of challenging kind of concept um, or a really kind of challenging message to kind of articulate um so i think that would that's that definitely sort of plays a part in that yeah how have your clients responded to it? Really positively, yeah. It's, 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 it's been immense. And um, the way we saw it as well, it, it, it was all about kind of accelerating what we do and, you know, making our what we do so much more um, diverse and relevant in, in, in what is a, a kind of massively, massively changing industry. Brilliant. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit about as well some of the other offices that you've got uh, bon Brian has and the sorts of opportunities that are in those cities, for example, in Sheffield? In Sheffield, yeah. So that um, th there's 
that is the, the biggest office that we've got um, around sort of 80, 80 architectural staff. And, and uh, the workload at the moment, um, I mean, it, it, we, we tend to cover a wide range of sectors, obviously residential. Um, we do a lot of commercial work, um, education will, will, and will always be a, a kind of massive component to the practice. Uh, blue light is a really emerging and interesting sector for us and um, advanced manufacturing, which came out of um, a project which the uh, University of Sheffield were involved in and that's how we kind of made that leap in, into that sector and our involvement within the advanced manufacturing park on the kind of Sheffield Rotherham border I think is really sort of testimony to the direction that the UK wants to take. So that's a master plan site um, but the, uh, that we, we master planned and we're also involved in the design and the delivery of a number of buildings up there but the kind of caliber of companies that are moving in um, uh, Boeing, um, uh, McLaren, uh, Rolls-Royce etc you know big manufacturing companies and stuff which will really kind of contribute to that northern economy. Yeah. Um, but we're, we're, I'd probably say we're one of maybe three, four architects in the UK that uh, have kind of expertise within that sector. So it, it, it's a, re a really exciting one. Fantastic. And how is Bon Brian, how does the, how are the offices actually structured internally? Does it much more like a kind of studio based system? So often when we talk to larger practices, they're often comprised of maybe, you know, six, seven people within a group working on maybe one or two projects. And then those are kind of networked. Is that the similar sort of structure or do you yeah, have much pretty much? Like I think COVID COVID has been really interesting because um, historically they were kind of officers working independently um, with sort of various teams who'd only work on those projects. But I think what sort of COVID has taught us to work a lot more smarter and use and allocate resource um, between the offices. So we're seeing a lot more kind of intercollaboration on projects where it'll be a combination of kind of Western London, Sheffield and Birmingham working on the same project. And we choose the resource for the right skill set. So I think that's kind of really exciting for uh, the uh, sort of new potential direction for the practice. And I'm a big fan as well of sort of spreading knowledge um, um, in between offices because um, certain offices can get almost kind of pigeonholed into certain sectors, certain specialisms, etc. So for example, in the context of what we're doing in modern methods, of construction uh, and design for man uh, and, and DFMA historically that expertise was all concentrated in our Westrom office because we were doing so much schools and education work using MMC right. uh, now we've utilized that resource and made the leap into using MMC in residential contexts so doing a number of exciting projects with Berkeley homes where we've uh, used MMC on that um, we're working with uh, the developer investor top hat on the Kitchener barracks scheme which is a, a kind of pioneering uh, volumetric um, MMC scheme um, down in Kent and then this year alone has been really important for the direction of MMC and we've got a number of appointments uh, throughout the UK using or where there's a desire from the client to pursue the opportunity in MMC. So we've just been recently been appointed by a developer to as a design partner in the next phase of uh, developing their house and apartment types. And another project up in Sheffield where we're going to be using a um, MMC solution. But to resource that and spread that skill set, we've got the Western team where that predominant expertise is and collaborated with the wider officers. So it yeah. spreads that skill set, which I think is really important. And that's an interesting knowledge base as well to have and to be acquiring as a business. Absolutely. Um, how how do you actually keep that in house, and how do you how what kind of relationships do you have with actual the manufacturers of those processes? Yeah, so we've we these are um, these are partnerships that we've built up over I'd say the last sort of ten to fifteen years, and right. uh, again our experience within uh, the education sector was absolutely crucial to that to being able to kind of accelerate relationships with the likes of um, Premier Modular and um, and other partners. So in terms of so in terms of working with new clients within the education sector, it means that, you know, we've got kind of six, seven partners that we can recommend to them if need be. You know, we've got sort of 10 to 15 years of um, knowledge transfer that we can bring into the residential sector to kind of give us a really sort of decent platform um, in, in, in respect of that. Um, but uh, and particularly in this year alone, um, we are seeing a bigger desire with city regions and local authorities across the UK to pursue MMC. So for a practice like us, it's, it's, going, to be, it's, it's going to be an unbelievable opportunity for us. 
Has, has it been something where your developer clients and particularly in the residential sectors have been asking for or has it all been the time? Like- yeah, ab- absolutely. All the time. Yeah. And um, it's, it's just taken a while to get off the ground because whereas I would say a lot of the MMC expertise is actually in the north of England, in, in Yorkshire, whether it's Ilka, um, the, um, there's, an, a, there's a research lab at the Advanced Manufacturing Park, which is specifically for modern methods of construction, which has been endorsed by Homes England and uh, the um, Ministry of Housing and Local Government. But the issue has always been viability and that was the biggest wake up call for me moving back back up north at how challenging viability is on sites and projects generally across most sectors. But um, MMC as a as a choice has only really been viable in London, the southeast, and we're just starting to see that become more of a preferred solution and a viable solution for um, for, for, for projects, um, certainly in the Midlands and, and definitely in the north going forward. But it's, it's about understanding both. I mean, what, what we typically do, and it came out of our work with um, Berkeley Group um, in London, where we took a scheme on from Reba Stage 2 uh, within their Royal Arsenal Riverside development and, and right. basically delivered it out from them. But one of the things that we offered at Reba Stage 2 was a um, MMC uh, optioneering exercise where we basically produce a report looking at the viability of uh, modern methods of construction versus traditional. And because we've got that knowledge base in house, it's something that we, that we can offer. And that's what we sort of tend to do for, for clients to kind of marry, marry the two. But I think over the next sort of five to 10 years, particularly, we'll definitely see MMC being the more kind of viable solution because we got a, just because of the time, really. It's, it's been fascinating. When I worked at RSHP, we were working on you know things like Oxley Woods and I was involved in MMC um, kind of innovation, if you like. Mm. But it was we always really struggled in terms of being able to get those kind of projects delivered. Um, yeah. And particularly the sort of larger house builders were very reluctant to absolutely to, to take those kinds of risks, if you like. Yeah. Um, how how have how have Bon Brian managed to negotiate those kinds of hesitations, if you like? We 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 have to, we just aligned ourselves with the right partners. Uh, the the um, the sort of traditional house builders and sort of traditional developers have been reluctant to kind of take it on because of viability and risk. But what we're seeing is a we're seeing a renewed attitude from the public sector about using MMC on sites. Um, so for example, in the context of the West Midlands, so the West Midlands Combined Authority, their kind of single framework is specifically aimed at unlocking uh, brownfield land, which is owned by the public sector f- uh, with a preference for MMC. In other words, it's all about delivery. So it's been no surprise why you've seen the kind of the likes of Urban Splash um, and other developers really kind of accelerate in, in that kind of MMC field because it's such an untapped landscape. Mm. Um, but it's really exciting going forward, I think, because you've got kind of opposite ends of the scale. You've got kind of Urban Splash. There's a, a Leeds-based developer called Situ um, who, who did the, well, the Climate Innovation District in, in Leeds City Centre, which is kind of Urban Splash and it's, it's kind of look and feel. But that kind of product only really occupies, I'd probably say about 2 3% of the market in terms of an audience. And then at the opposite end of the scale, you've got the kind of likes of Ilka and other providers where it's more aimed at a kind of, a kind of low cost RP model. But what it means is there's a huge landscape um, for um, more of a mainstream product, which is largely untapped um, that many developers are kind of working in, which I think is going to be a really good opportunity. And, you know, the, the likes of who we're working with in respect of that top hat and inner space homes, I think are going to do really well that are kind of appealing to that mainstream mm. audience in MMC and whilst there's a, such a strong desire from the public sector to dispose of their big sites through a partnership agreement with a preference for MMC they're going to be in poor position to benefit from that. It also seems to marry very well with the vertical integration that the rest of Bon Brian has in terms of being multidisciplinary and absolutely the MMC seems to be a, a yeah, really great marriage because it's kind of single point of single single point of contact if you like for many many of your clients absolutely yeah i couldn't agree more really really interesting um you were talking earlier about some of the main challenges to viability yeah in projects what are some of those challenges that you guys have found and how you navigate around them landscape um you know schemes are so landscape led these days um 
the fact that we we offer landscape services and if landscape architects collaborating with architects from the inception that often makes landscape led solutions uh, viable um deliverability um and uh for example, and I don't mean I don't mean deliverability in, in, in terms of on site, it's how it's coordinated. So again, you know, the roles of digital technology and BIM are absolutely key to that. Right. Where we can work closely with contractors from the outset. And I'm a big fan of getting contractors engaged as, as early on, you know, you know, pre-planning on, you know, what's the best way and most efficient way of, of, of building that building married with the design vision. And of, of, of course, um, and, you know, BIM as a platform allows us to do that. You know, we can coordinate, um, uh, uh, or we can influence program and efficiency sort of time on site. And that, that's absolutely key to viability. And then just good design, employing good designers. The, the first thing that gets value engineered out is, you know, depth and layering in facade, which, you know, from a longevity point of view, placemaking perspective, it, it's absolutely key that you get kind of good quality facades. In a lot of the kind of regional projects, the facades can look quite flat. Mm. it's the only way to make them viable but you know having you know it's, it's just kind of good design at the end of the day to kind of rationalize that which kind of marries the design vision with planning policy and and uh, and a development appraisal but yeah it's been a huge wake-up call really, and that's for sure really interesting how how has a bomb brian or how does bomb brian at the moment currently engage with business development how do you go about winning new work in new sectors and and kind of expanding the client base, if you like? Through a range of different sources. I mean, um, relationships are absolutely key. And, you know, I, I realized this from a young age, I, I kind of two people have made a massive impact on this. Um, uh, Deborah Saunt when I was at university and then uh, working with Phil Coffey. And the, the emphasis that they played on relationships as, you know, absolutely testimony to, you know, being successful and being able to kind of win work. And I've, you know, if there's any young architects listening, I just cannot stress that enough. And it's absolutely key in practice. So yeah, relationships and, you know, getting out there and meeting people, um, I would say a lot of architects probably spend too much time with other architects. Myself, I'd, I'd been guilty of that historically. But, yep. you know, when I start to engage with, with, with people from other disciplines, uh, not necessarily go to kind of architectural networking events, go to kind of property ones, construction ones, th that, that's absolutely key. So we put a big emphasis on that. Um, and MIPIMs are really important to us and being at events and, and, and conferences. Uh, we've and as a consequence of that and just being a kind of being out there and, and being engaged with things we often get invited to kind of contribute to these as well so for example i'm speaking at the build to rent conference in birmingham and being coordinated by biz now um, i get asked to regularly appear on on their webinars um we are contributing unfortunately it's been postponed till next year but to the the footprint conference which is uh, the first of its kind this year which is it's in Brighton. It's, it's following the MIPIM format, but with a renewed emphasis on carbon zero. So marrying that kind of that, that kind of property element with with sustainability and, and, and net zero follows the same format of MIPIM. And we're doing an event on the first morning, uh, which is you know all about the, all about the stuff that's really important to us. So that so there's that. And then, um, you know, just getting out there. It's been a really interesting year from um, a, a COVID perspective mm -hmm. and not being able to kind of actually meet people sort of physically. So we've set up a number of initiatives just to kind of, you know, get our name out there. One is um, Coffee Cast, which the first episode was launched a couple of weeks ago. So that was put on, put on our Twitter and LinkedIn channels. And it's also available on our website. But essentially, we established Coffee Cast because we feel we need a, or there's a gap in the market for a platform that isn't a round table that nobody reads. It's um, not um, a really long kind of blog post. It's like a podcast, but it's only six, seven minutes long. So it's something that you can watch in between your virtual meetings in the time that it takes to have a cup of coffee it's as simple as that and there's a particular focus on the built to rent sector uh, on, on that one but we've we, we've got a number of um and a number of kind of initiatives um, through the year um and then um it's just about just relationships and, and links within the right way and then the the last thing i'd add to that is relationships to break into new sectors it's looking at what you can do in a particular sector and realizing how you could add value in another so for example the the, the mmc element uh, example would, would be absolutely testimony to that where you know we had the skills in-house we had the relationships in-house within the education and we transferred it into the educator the residential sector to add value brilliant um 
how obviously the, the business has grown quite considerably over the last 30 years and yeah. in, in the last four or five years or since 2017 since you've you've been there as well what sorts of changes have you seen in the business uh, massive, yeah. Renewed attitude, definitely across the business to to, to how we do stuff. Because, um, and obviously, I, I can't speak before before I, I joined Bon Brian, but um, and that's because it's been reflective of the, the type of work that we, that we do. And um, we we do something called a First Friday, which is. Um, first Friday of the month, it's an office-wide event where you know, a lot of practices do this. You know, we talk about the kind of current projects that we're doing, a new new project wins, what's happening across the office. And th- then there's the kind of Christmas special one. And I realized it at the end of this year, just you know, how much qu- quality residential work we're doing across the country. Mm. Whereas three years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. It had been 10% of our business. And I think um, I always say to young architects and, and uh, the minute you the minute you start thinking you know it all within a particular sector within a particular way of doing stuff, I think architecture quickly bites you on the back. And um, you know, being able to work in different sectors and have those skills and stuff definitely changes definitely definitely changes the culture of the business. And I'd, I'd probably say it's been fair to say that that's that's what's happened at Bon Brian. Really interesting. How do you guys navigate or preserve company culture and the kind of values that perhaps were established 30 years ago? How do they, do they kind of constantly get renewed or revived within the, like strategically within the business? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say so. Yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of um, kind of listening to staff and listening to concerns. And, um, you know, I've got to credit, you know, our HR department and, and the directors who are really kind of uh, put a big emphasis on engaging with staff and understanding, you know, what their opinions are on how, the, how we do stuff to kind of create a culture where individuals can thrive. I think it's absolutely key. Yeah, I think, you know, gone are the days of... Um, you know, one set mind, you know, being responsible for everything and stuff. I think, you know, the, the, the biggest thing I, I've learned about architecture is how collaborative it, collaborative it is. And, um, you know, the most important uh, people to a business are the staff. Yeah. How do you guys find great staff? Through a number of avenues, we've got really good links. If it's younger architects, we've got really good links with the schools of architecture. Um, uh, myself and, and, and staff across the business uh, get involved in crits. Um, uh, um we uh, advertise on sort of various platforms uh, relationships linkedin's been really good and um, certainly in the time that i've been Bir- I've, I've been in birmingham i've been really impressed with how many young architects reach out and use linkedin as a kind of platform i think it you know it shows a lot of confidence for for, for people at their level um that's really good but i think yeah it's, it's just having relationships as well and then on a more senior kind of job running established level I think, you know, it's, it's having those relationships and, you know, who do we know who, who would be kind of right for our business in that respect? Yeah. What's what's in store for the rest of 2021? It's going to be really exciting. I mean, obviously, um, you know, Birmingham is going to be a, a massive gr- uh, growth area for us. Um, we've got um, a number of exciting appointments um, on the horizon, both with um, existing clients and a combination of, um, of, of new clients. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm really excited the direction that the country's taking. Um, all the noises I get from investors, developers, uh, local authorities, it's, it's going to be an amazing opportunity for, arch- for architects over the next sort of five years. I think it's a very different situation to the 2008 mm. um, crisis. And I think there's a lot to be positive for, definitely. Well, that's a very optimistic view. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad to hear that. Um, and on, on that as well, on the, on the future, how has Bon Brian been dealing with, say, for example, the impacts of Brexit? Brexit. Has that has that affected the business a lot? We've seen a lot of companies in London that have got large European staff, you know, having concerns. It's bomb- I, I, yeah, I think it's all kind of mitigation measures at the end of the day. Um, it the within the context of the regions i'd probably only say it may have delayed things but i wouldn't say that's kind of out and out brexit as such it was more the um, issues around kind of certainty for businesses around a deal or no deal or you know whether we'd come out of it or not so i I can't say for certain that it it was a direct impact Um, but it's just about you know using efficiently you know 
and it comes back to how we work and our delivery methodology. So from a kind of specification perspective, the way that we track data using BIM, et cetera, means that you know, we can consider a range of different material specifications for a particular building type that would mitigate that risk. And with a lot of the kind of bids that we would been doing at the time, we put a big emphasis on that, that you know, we have those kind of contingency measures in place. Um, access to labor um, will, that issue was probably more of an issue for London than the regions um, in terms of it being more reliant perhaps on, on EU labour than, than what you get certainly in the north and, and, and Birmingham. But that's where things like kind of MMC and, and volumetric and, um, and offsite are going to be key for the UK and the, and the success of the UK about, you know, reskilling um, what were kind of traditional job, uh, jobs into redefining a kind of new construction industry with, uh, for, 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 for kind of young people. Brilliant. Tomash, thank you so much. I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation there. Brilliant. Thanks, Rian. We've covered a lot of territory and we've got a really great insight into uh, Bomb Brian um, and, your, and your work and your role, particularly how you guys are uh, liaising and working with developer clients. It's really, really insightful. Thank you. Not a problem. Thanks for this morning. Pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.